In a recent video, I agreed to a claim of the existence of male privilege in American culture. Many people get uncomfortable when they encounter a nuanced position that doesn't make assertions with complete conviction. Some consider it capping out of an argument if you don't throw down your money completely on one side or the other. Yet, on many issues, I find both sides are usually right about some things and wrong about others. Or they may both be right, but for different reasons. Some of those people on the ends of the spectrum just get as upset about people being somewhere in the middle as they do about people being on the opposite end, which in this case led to comments from feminists upset that I wasn't adopting their label, and from MRAs angry that I think male privilege happens to exist. The kind of questions I got on that topic were very telling of a misunderstanding of what it is that's meant by privilege. Questions like, what laws on the books are against women, and if there's nothing legally holding women back, then how can they possibly be underprivileged, etc. I hope to tackle that misunderstanding here. Most people resent being told that they are privileged, and for good reason. It feels like it devalues anything a privileged person accomplishes. Equally dangerous is for an underprivileged group to use that as an excuse to not bother aspiring to achieve because they begin the race well behind the starting line while others get a significant head start. So, why bother? I've also resisted claims of privilege myself because I was being told that due to my privilege over another group, I couldn't possibly understand them. I wholeheartedly reject that as an absurd notion as my sense of empathy is not limited to those with whom I share every observable demographic. I may not know exactly how it feels to fall under every demographic on the planet, but I can still understand them by listening to them and drawing from my own experiences to make a connection. I've never been strapped into an electric chair, so I don't know what that feels like exactly, but I can certainly empathize with someone who's about to be executed based on thought experiments, listening to the descriptions of people who've been on the verge of their own demises, and comparing it to different types of near-death experiences of my own. But that rejection of mine shouldn't be so broad-sweeping as to resist the privilege of which I'm being accused or assigned. So. If you're only bringing up privilege to devalue someone else's accomplishments, insist that they can't possibly understand you, or provide an excuse for why you or a group shouldn't bother trying to work at success within the current system, then you're contributing to the problem. You're being the key element to why the dominant demographics often reject the entire concept of privilege rather than accept it and work at it. So what exactly is meant by privilege? Well, the unfortunate reality is that Monopoly, albeit a game largely dictated by the luck of a dice roll, is far more fair than life. In a game of Monopoly, everyone starts on the same square, dice rolls affect them all the same, no matter what game piece each is playing with, everyone starts with the same amount of money, and as long as they have money, anyone can buy whatever each can afford if he or she lands on it. It would be great if the real world in America worked similar to that, but it doesn't. Imagine if your game piece were chosen randomly, which gave each player a unique set of starting conditions he or she has no control over. Some people start with a go directly to jail card, some start with a get out of jail free card, some start on free parking, and people have radically different amounts of starting money, while some start the game with already owning property. Now, apart from those starting conditions, all the other rules on paper may be exactly the same, but just because the game's the same doesn't mean it's even close to being fair with those starting conditions being altered. If you see a game like that happening, and you can admit that some players don't have as good of a chance of winning as others, and we'd be better off if the game treated everyone the same from beginning to end, then congratulations, you've been able to recognize that some of those players had privilege. Economic privilege is the easiest to recognize because it's so quantifiable. Not many people would argue that if you're born rich, you're much luckier. Economic privilege is the easiest to recognize because it's so quantifiable. Not many people would argue that if you're born rich, you're much luckier than someone born poor, and your accomplishments in life will never be regarded as anywhere near as impressive as someone who accomplishes the same thing or things from a rags to riches background. This is so evident that hip-hop culture often strives to point out just how poor and ghetto an artist was prior to their current luxurious state, but makes essentially no effort to explain the hard work or specific means of achieving their success that they underwent. Their own culture would reject them if they were born rich, but if they started off poor, it makes members of their culture so vicariously euphoric for them that they want to send them even more of their own money to bolster that status. Economic status is only one demographic, though. Just like starting money is only one factor that can affect a player's odds and how the game feels in our Monopoly example. 
Add in that if the banker doesn't like your game piece, then you get less than the $200 stipend for pass and go. Or that even if you can afford it, if the property manager doesn't like your game piece, there are certain properties that he's not willing to admit are for sale. Hopefully this helps you start to see, if you didn't already, why asking a question like how women or minorities can possibly be underprivileged if there aren't specific laws holding them back from advancing in our society is a silly question. Let's get away from the game analogy and look at another demographic which most of my viewers can directly relate to. In America, Christian privilege is highly evident. Even though no laws exist banning companies from hiring atheists, if you're an open atheist who walks into an interview room with four to five executives that all happen to be fundamentalist Christians who know you're an atheist, your chances of getting that job just drop dramatically. There's also no law prohibiting an open atheist or Muslim from running for president. However, I want you to ask yourself for a moment, if any single one of the presidents in the entire history of America had run on identical platforms to what they did, but had been open atheist or an open Muslim, would any of them, any of the presidents who won the elections, have stood a chance in the presidential election? Would they even get past the primaries, or would their parties even bother to nominate them? If you have any understanding of American culture, you know the answer is a clear no. They wouldn't stand a chance, even though they are the winners throughout history. All their things are the same. If they had been open atheists or a Muslim, there's no way they would have won in any of those elections. You also know that American society portrays religious minorities like atheists and Muslims in a very unfair and highly negative light. Due to cultural depictions, many American citizens think that atheists worship the devil. Yes, to those of you living in the UK, you heard that correctly or that the word Muslim is synonymous with terrorist. These are the sort of things that lead me to consider females to be un underprivileged gender. And for the record, since some comments brought it up to, yes, of course, transsexuals and every gender identity between male and female are even more underprivileged. Women live in a society that has come a long way in their favor in the last few decades. And while I do consider it one of legal equity, I don't consider it one of social equality. And it's not even for the tangible issues such as income gap, which you can look at statistics on that skew the argument in either favor, as with most statistics. It's observations that most executive authorities and companies and politics are still men. Most advertising and gender objectification is aimed toward men. Hell, most of the women and comfortable discussing the topic with me have complained that even pornography is essentially targeted toward men. And that's one of the few industries where women are actually treated objectively better than men. And within that system, that particular industry, women have privilege. Now, these things affect a person's psychology growing up. If your demographic is the one that's being appealed to and showcasing strong and successful models, then growing up you feel more empowered than a demographic that society by and large objectifies. Again, we've made a lot of progress in that area, but I don't feel like we're at a state of social equality yet. Lastly, those who argue that women in the West are better off than those in many other countries, and therefore they should just shut up and be happy they aren't forced into a burqa, your claims repulse me. Granted, we have a lot to be thankful for in the U.S., but that doesn't mean we should just be satisfied that we have it better than someone somewhere else and never work to improve as long as we're doing better than someone. If you have a dollar to your name, then you have more money than some people. If you have $20, that's 20 times more. Does that mean you should be perfectly content with having $20 to your name and just shut up and not try to get any more? Now, are there areas in our society that actually favor females tangibly and significantly? Of course there are, which is part of why I don't identify as a feminist. I care about equality for women and men, and if you want more details on that label issue, that's what my previous video was about. It's linked below. Our society has double standards against both men and women, which can be an entirely different video. But this video isn't about proving female privilege or male privilege, nor was the previous video about that, even if that's what the majority of people wanted to comment about. This video is to discuss and explain what privilege means, and if you want to argue in favor of or in opposition to the privilege and or rights of men and women in this country, there are plenty of videos and blogs and forums on the internet to do so with people who are passionately interested in having that dialogue with you. I'm not. I only hope this video clearly explained what social privilege itself is.